So, hey guys, uh, you're very well, welcome to our new Engage People videocast. Uh, so I guess our, our purpose as a business is to align, to align uh, business with talent, uh, primarily in the financial arena where we operate. Um, so I guess as part of my day today, I'm very lucky to chat to lots of cool people and, and very interesting uh, businesses and individuals uh, who, who run who run these businesses. Uh, and someone who I've been really excited about speaking to over recent years uh, that we have on today is Ronan Percival, who's the founder of uh, Far. Uh, was part of an entrepreneurship who are um, high achievers today. Uh, Rowan's very passionate about Irish businesses and particularly Irish businesses who, uh, you know, who, who continue to achieve and, and, and uh, well, who go on to achieve their potential basically over the longer term. Uh, so Rowan, we'll, we'll chat all about all things hiring related, culture related. Uh, I guess, first of all, we're, we're recording this in late April uh, 2020. We're in the height of COVID-19. How, how, how have things been with you? Uh, yeah, th thanks for having me on, uh, Paul. Uh, excited to be on it. Um, yeah, so the, it's been no more than anyone else. Um, really interesting times and it's gone from extreme stress, I would say, at the start uh, in mid-March, sorry, in mid-March when it first started to kick in and no one had any idea of what, you know, how long this is going to go on for and um, we still don't 100% know how long it's going to go on for, but I think there's a bit more understanding of it. So we've had to had pretty tough, you know, like many people we've had to do a few layoffs and um, pay cuts and things like that and take a bit of pain up front and um, which hopefully buys us time then to see this through and come out fighting at the other end. Yeah, pretty good. And if we just maybe just a brief sort of backstory in, in relation to Forest, maybe how long have you guys been in operation? Maybe just as to, because I, I know you're sort of a truly global operation today, so maybe just a, a, a sort of a, a business overview would be helpful to understand. Yeah, so uh, Forest is, um, it's been going 15 years and uh, it's, we do software for the hair and beauty sector. So appointments, apps, taking bookings online, payments, um, uh, doing all their marketing tools. So helping them do email promotions, SMS promotions, um, running ads on Instagram. So basically anything for a salon that helps them grow their business, get their customers back in the door, spending more with them. And uh, so it started out originally 15 years ago, I worked in a salon as a receptionist. So it started out uh, just all it did was just doing appointment reminders to cut down on no-shows. And then over the 15 years, it's the product has grown into this sort of very large product that pretty much does everything for a salon. Um, and then it's gone from just being in Ireland the first few years to the UK. So we're number one in the market in Ireland and the UK now, we have about 4,000 salons between Ireland and the UK. And it's over the last three years, it's expanded fairly rapidly abroad as well. So we have an office in Philly, a um, couple of thousand salons in the US using Forest now, and um, nearly a thousand salons using us in Germany, which is our fastest growing market. Um, and then also in Switzerland, Austria, we're basically all the German speaking places. We're in Finland and we have an office in Australia as well, which uh, only recently opened, but going really well there too. So starting to really reach out as the products come stronger and stronger, it's it's um, having more resonance, you know, in all these different markets around the world. So it's exciting, yeah. Yeah, pretty good. And were you always cut out for an entrepreneurial lifestyle? So obviously you were, you, you were an employee at one stage. Did you decide early, early doors that you wanted to, to, to run your own business? Yeah, I'd be honest. I knew from about the age of nine or 10 that I was going to always have my own business. So it was always what I wanted to do. I've started a few little things even when I was a teenager. So uh, always cut out for it. My dad had his own business. He's just himself now, a food delivery business in the west of Ireland. So I grew up surrounded by, you know, loading his van, him going to collect money from people or they're not paying him and all that kind of stuff from a very young age and the stresses that came with that. So I was kind of brought up around in that kind of environment and uh, always knew, was always telling him what he should be doing with his business, none of which he, he listened to. And he probably shouldn't have because they were really bad uh, advice that I was giving him when I was 12. But um, yeah, so I always, always was going to do this. And even though I went to college and I worked in a salon, I was, I was only working in the salon as a job after college to earn some cash while I yeah. worked on coming up with an idea. So um, yeah. 
So I, like w w one of the, and you, you and I have been working together, uh, you know, and engage people work with Forrest uh, over the last sort of two or three years. And one, one of the things that sort of struck me was uh, just your attention to detail in particular around the hiring process um, and how, I mean, you're certainly very, very high standards in terms of the type of people you look to employ. Uh, and, and we'll break that down a little bit, but was that always the case? W was, was people always a big feature for you from the early days of Forrest? Um yeah, uh, I wouldn't say the very start. I wouldn't have understood about employing people. And, you know, I, I wouldn't have understood it that deeply now, to be honest, when I started. Um, obviously, my co-founder is a guy called Jamie, who's, who's a brilliant sales guy. And he, he was a very visionary kind of guy. So he was, a, a, I'd founded a business with somebody really, uh, really smart but um in terms of employing other people i think it took me a while to understand that it took me a few years i actually i what i um i read a book called good to great in about 2006 when we were about two or three years in mm -hmm. and that had a really big effect on me yeah. uh, a lot of people have read his jim collins book it's a really famous business book one of the most famous business books but in it he talked about how um people come before strategy he has this phrase called get the right people on the bus which I'm sure you work in, in uh, the recruitment area. You know, you've mm -hmm. heard that phrase many times and he kind of coined that. And yeah. uh, it's get the right people on the bus and the more effort you put into picking the right people at the start, um, the better your strategy will go and the faster you will grow. And um, that had a big impact on me reading that book. And as a result, I just got really immersed in understanding all the techniques out there for hiring the best people. And there is, particularly when you're a company like, we didn't raise any money. So we were bootstrapped business from the early days up until about 2011. So we, we couldn't pay the best salaries. Um, we didn't have a profile. So we didn't, we didn't have loads of people applying to work for us. You know, we weren't Google or something who were just gonna have amazing candidates apply to them. So it's easy for them to select the best people. But uh, we didn't have that at all. So we had to identify really good people from just anyone who applied to Forest. So these people mightn't have, you know, amazing degrees or, or, you know, have all the fantastic CV, but so we were effectively trying to find diamonds in the rough, I suppose, is one way of looking at it. And so just research loads about it, find out all about the best psychometric testing that you can do um, to identify people who are much better than maybe they look. Um, and so we started incorporating psychometric testing in about 2008 and we just do, we, so we've been doing that for 12 years and learned more and more about it every year. Um, that was a big part of it. We also learned about top grading, which is a special type of interviewing, um, which has a much higher rate of success than normal interviews. Um, learned about that around that time as well. So we incorporated that. So we're able, like if you, if you basically do um, things like top grading and you do psychometric testing and you have a hundred people, you're going to have find a lot more of those 100 people that actually are the people that you really want to hire um, and then also understanding your own values as well so if you have very strong values and culture and then you hire for those values um, you're more likely to have success too like you're basically hiring someone not necessarily for the right attitude because every business wants is has a different culture and will want a different kind of attitude but if you hire the right person like psychometrically they're they're suited to your business they you know on the interviewing process you've really delved into what they've done before and what they haven't done or how they think and then you've done things like you've you in during that process you've identified that they have the same values that you have as a business that person is much more likely to succeed with you um and we were able to find those people just from the general population uh, and not you know because people weren't going oh, i want to work in forest you know mm. so we, were, we were getting people like who's forest so we were trying to, you know, to unearth those people. And yeah. we found as well that our interviewing process turned off a lot of people because they were like, well, I don't know who Forrest are. Like, why would I go mm. through all this hassle to join Forrest? Yeah. Um, but that worked well. It, it meant we lost out on candidates, but it actually worked well because the people who were prepared to go through that actually turned out to be the kind of people we wanted anyway. Yeah, yeah. And um, it annoyed a lot of recruiters, to be honest, Paul. Mm. So like a lot of people would be, yeah, what do you do? You know, they get annoyed mm. with them, particularly during the good times because they're like, you know, this candidate's going to go somewhere else. Yeah. Like, we just learned to just go, well, that's okay. They're going somewhere else. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Not to get swayed by that because the, 
obviously recruiter wants to get the person into the job yeah. um, and, and the person wants the job. So they're probably going to look, I want to move. I want to move. And uh, so we just have to learn to be really patient. And um, so we lost out on pe- a lot of people during with this process, but overall it's built up a much stronger culture and it's been, yeah. great, you know, and now obviously the company is a bit better known and we, we have, we, we can attract, you yeah. know, uh, more people and then they're more prepared to go through the process because they're like okay this is forest process so i want to yeah. join forest so i'll go through it so it's a bit easier now to kind of get people to go through it yeah. but it certainly it was tougher at the start and yeah. just on the psychometric if you break it down a little bit just so the psychometric test is mcquaig is your primary that's yeah, your, your preference it we, we use it and we know it really well okay. um i don't think it's like it's not necessarily the best one out there mm. the best one that I found um, when, you know, went back in, in, uh, you know, 12, 13 years ago. Um, and it's improved since then. It's still very good. Um, but there is other ones. I mean, there's lots yeah. of psychometric testing yeah. out there. So yeah. I, I, can't, you, I can't talk to that other stuff, but n- nothing has come along that's better than McQuaid. Like nothing's come, yeah. like it's as good if I read about something or talk to yeah. people who use it. And they can and, value from it. Mm. And you, you like the personality testing side and then there's a sort of a, um, uh, numerical reasoning it, it, that's it's called something else so yeah, it's, it's mental agility that's the, the mental agility. yeah so there's a couple yeah. of things that are interesting around that so like the psychometric testing is more telling you what type of person you are and what type of job you'd be suited to so yeah like sales people uh like there's two types of sales people for example there's like hunters and gatherers right you know there's people who will um go out there do cold calling and will literally just they'll fight till they till they just get get clients on board right that kind of salesperson is different to a gatherer kind of salesperson who's much more relationship driven and, you know, is really good at developing the relationships, but isn't quite as good at maybe closing the deal and stuff like that. And you understanding that those are very different personality types and you don't necessarily know which one is which when you meet somebody, you know, because they can both be very charming if they're a salesperson. So how do you know which one is which? And so psychometric testing tells you, and therefore you have, you know, on our new business side where we're trying to acquire new customers, it's much, it's much a harder sell. So we, that type of psychometric profile works for that. And we would never hire somebody who doesn't have that psychometric profile for that job. Um, and then for the relationship side, that's much more what we call, you know, it's like customer success or like the people who are upgrading existing clients or looking after them or whatever. That kind of profile is slightly less, uh, is a different profile. And if you mix those people around, they, they get annoyed. Like the people who are really good at like the new sales, if they're in a sort of relationship building side, they get frustrated and, and actually mm. don't look like they're doing a good job. Um, they're just in the wrong seat, like to yeah. Jim Collins analogy. Um, and then the people who are good at relationship building, like they could be really bad at the new sales and never close anything. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Have lots of conversations, never close anything. So just that stuff matters like massively, you know, mm. you, get, you know, you're dealing with, people failing in their roles. Um, like what's the point in going through that if someone's not cut out for it anyway? Do you, yeah. know what I mean? you might as well just know that up front and not save yourself a year's hassle. Yeah. Um, yeah. And things like that. And it's better for the person as well that they're doing totally. and that suits them, right? So yeah. So understanding all that has been really good. And like we've made mistakes over the years. Like we've you really like someone in an interview and they don't, you know, say you have a manager working for a forest and they're newer and they don't really fully buy into this whole McQuaig thing because they've been successful in a previous career and they never did it. Hmm. Like, no, no, I really like this guy. And we're like, look on the profile, it doesn't look like he'll succeed. And nine times out of 10, you know, you let people make the mistakes themselves. They have to be able to make the mistakes. Yeah. Like, look, you know, we told you you wouldn't, it was on the McQuaig and um, you went ahead anyway. That's cool. But I think now you understand, you know, this does work. So let's go back and start using it. And then, you'll get a lot of those managers then buying into it much more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then it starts to work for them and then it just becomes part of what they do, you know? So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit now on the mental agility side. So that's a new thing. So McQuaig brought that out or they had it for years, but they only brought it out online a couple of years ago. And so they just, we talk to the guys in McQuaig a lot, you know, always asking them for new, the new angles they have mm. and the questioning or new understanding that they have. But they, they said this mental agility thing is very good because so basically what it does is, it, it, it tells you somebody's ability to um, uh, learn on the job. 
Yeah. And people with a high 50, education. 50 questions that come thick and fast, I'm right in saying. Yeah, yeah. And you have to. Yeah, yeah I've done hard it. To yeah. They're very hard. But it's yeah. not a be all and end all. But like basically, you, for certain jobs, you just need high mental agility. Hmm. So we already have a system for this, which is basically the leaving cert. Um, so like if somebody has 600 points in the leaving cert, they have high mental agility. Hmm. Um, so you. Again, it's kind of like if you're if you're working for like you know if you're a big brand like Google or whoever, you only take like they only accept applicants for like a load of roles who are yeah. have gone to a certain university, or they yeah. used to do this. There's only seven yeah. universities in the, in Europe that they accepted people from, and in order to get into those universities, you probably had 500 plus points. So they yeah. like they were effectively doing that anyway, but they wouldn't have been saying it out like that. But that's effectively what they're doing. Uh, by having a rule like that and like you know there's loads of companies goldman sachs or whatever all have the same rules but we can't do that so um not that we even want to do that but we can't do that but what we can do is we can identify those people in the general population and um, so people who may not have even like gone to college or whatever can have high high mental agility yeah and they'll be cut out from going to a company like that but they're actually just as smart as people who are in there right so what we're looking for is looking for those people in the general population and it's really helped us identify like amazing performers who yeah. like could have done that, but for whatever reason, you know, they didn't get the chance to. And uh, you, went wrong, and, th- and now they have the ability to be really like, you know, they mightn't have done anything in their career up to this point, but they can. This person is going to be amazing if we can just put some time into them. And so we've identified a lot of people like that, and they've done really, really well for us. So. And- would you would you use it across? So obviously the roles we've we've worked together on have been on the finance side. If yeah. it was a another role, maybe that didn't require sort of a high, you know, obviously the the yeah you don't you don't need it for every role. And like it's not like oh if you don't have a high mental agility you're not yeah. smart. Work. Like a lot of people in forest have higher mental agilities than I have. Do you know what I mean? So like, mm. it's not it's not um, well, I don't necessarily think they do my job better. Yeah, it's not for every job. Um, yeah. and there's also like you know, um, all mental agility does is tells is. is it doesn't tell you how good somebody is with somebody. It doesn't yeah. tell you like if they're a good man manager. It doesn't tell you if they're going to have empathy for a situation with a customer, anything like that. Um, so it's just one factor. Like, so in finance, like, you know, a really good finance person has to have a high mental agility score. Like yeah. it just it doesn't matter how charming they are or how good at yeah. presenting and they can just looks like they have all the stuff. But if their mental yeah. agility isn't very high, they're just not going to be, they're not just not going to pick up on things. They're not going yeah. to join the dots as fast. Yeah. And um, that's just, it is useful. And like, you do have people who see, who often do have all the, you know, they have the degrees and all the stuff. Mm. And then you, you put them, you saw this, like you, we put them through the mental agility. It's like, they're not that good on that. Yeah. Yeah. And then on the back of that, you kind of go, well, that kind of makes sense. Cause I asked them a few questions. That actually, when you think about it, they didn't answer very well. Hmm. and uh, so yeah they're probably not cut out do you know what i mean so for what we'll be looking for it you know so it and basically it, able it enables for like a, co- a smaller company to compete with much yeah. larger companies without spending you know paying the big salaries to yeah. do that initially but we want to yeah. grow and we want to pay those people more it's not like we're trying to pay people less like we're still paying them a salary that they expect to get at the start and if they do really well forest does really well then they you know their salary goes up yeah um, but the mar- the market dictates sometimes. Than it would have done. Yeah, to go and join someone else. So I yeah. think um, it it works out for both of us. Yeah. And just in relation to the psychometric testing, the values piece, are they? Is there are there any way that they're interlinked at all? Do you think, Ron, in your in your opinion, if someone uh, their personality profiling from a psychometric perspective, you know, has a leaning, is that is that linked to values, or or would you classify the two areas being entirely separate? I know we're getting into the nitty gritty yeah, here. So, of, uh, yeah, no, that's, I'm, I'm I'm happy to. I get into this yeah. really all the time. Think about it all the time. So I'm happy yeah. to. If people watching this want to want to mm. get into this, yeah. So no values would be a, a little bit different. Um, we've three values in Forest. So one of them is um, what we call like a can-do attitude. So somebody just gets stuck in and kind of does stuff, and it doesn't have to be perfect. It's, take action rather than delay that's kind of the general vibe of that 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 value and like all values it's not perfect for every organization so if you were a surgeon you probably wouldn't want that because you wouldn't want to i'll just you know i just get stuck in here and in the middle of an operation and just see if if i tie these things together will it work and the person dies you know you're going to want to know exactly what you're doing so it's not um 
that value works really well in our organization where it's not life or death and it's better that we just do stuff and we help people help our clients faster than whether what we do for our clients is absolutely perfect um so that's one one value so that value uh, we would mostly pick that up in the interviewing so it's in the interviewing that you get the sense of whether somebody has that value or not. And we have a, like a question that as you're doing the interview, you have this, we have this questionnaire, which is top grading, which is a certain way of doing answers or questions. And then we mark every job that they've done. You have this range of questions that you ask about that job. And then at the end, you just mark, did you see any of the three values, forest values in what they've said in their job? Um, and then you also do reference checking. So reference checking is a big part of what we do as well. So one of the things we have is that the references have to ring us. We never ring a reference, haven't rung a reference in 10 years. Um, that's another thing that people struggle with. We'll ring a reference back if they try to ring us, obviously. Um, but some people can't get references to ring us. And that usually is a filter for us to know that maybe, you know, that person isn't right for the company as well. If you can't get somebody, one or two people to ring on your behalf, you know, that says a lot about you, we think. Yeah. Um, now we may, there may be, it's not always right. You know, there may be somebody who's amazing and couldn't get anyone to ring us. So they didn't get the job yet. And we probably missed out on a few people. Not saying it's an absolute definitive, but I'll tell you that you, you're going to do much better if you make all your references ring. You're yeah. going to end up with a be much stronger, um, uh, you're going to end up with a much stronger team if you do it this way, do you know? So there's a recent enough book called recruit rock stars by a guy called jeff hyman and one of his strategies he calls it backdoor references not, not everyone would see it as being ethical but that's yeah. effectively references where you try you know you speak to someone who's worked with the you know the person yeah. who you've identified uh without their knowledge necessarily or, or you do it sort of discreetly um yeah. and any sort of thoughts on that or i mean it's a different strategy i guess if you're yeah yeah you're, no, no, it's, it's not it's not um yeah like if we have a backdoor reference we'll always do it you know, did you work with that person before? Is there someone in the team who's worked with them? Go and ask them, or do they know somebody they could talk to? Yeah, it's yeah, it's in Ireland. It's it's reasonable. Like we, um, yeah, it's not part of our strategy. Like we've, it's not a, a part of what we do. Like the way it is mm. for the man. But um, but if if it if there is one to be had, we'll do it. Particularly if it's a senior person, because you you need to know both they need to know and you need to know that you're making the right choice. Because yeah, if it goes wrong. It's like quite costly you know yeah and just on the top grading piece then right so i i was familiar with top grading and then you and i obviously discussed it um so, so we worked together obviously in appointing a cfo a couple of years back and and, and there's been some, some positions since um and it is it, it's a full-on sort of interview it, you know th th there's quite a bit of time investment uh it leaves no stone unturned what, what what are you hoping for in terms of the earlier career pieces uh, so i guess two questions first of all what, what are you hoping for on that front and then secondly how long did it take you to get the buy-in across the team for that because to me it's from a company perspective you know people's their attention span when it comes to interviewing they want to be able to invest half an hour 45 minutes an hour whereas that process takes quite a bit longer so so just interested to hear your thoughts in relation to top grading yeah so um we didn't have a people department either until like last year so we got to maybe 180 people without a people department so um it was really important that all the managers embraced all these techniques yeah. um but yeah like people don't like they don't it just takes time i mean we've been doing it for a long time so yeah. it's part of our culture and it's kind of like this is the way we do it now our people team obviously enforced this now as well you know like it's much easier to go right every new hire has to have had the psychometrics. They have to have had the MAT. They have to have had the top grading interview. They have to have yeah. this call in and somebody doesn't get hired. Like I know that people team isn't going to hire someone unless that's happened. Do yeah. you know what I mean? And um, whereas the what before that, uh, there was definitely managers who didn't believe in it as much, who didn't take as much attention. Mm. And I'll be honest with you, most of the time they had more problems than some of their hires as well. Do you know what I mean? Right. You, so you um yeah now we're bigger it's just like this is just yeah it is, you know yeah fair so enough it's, fair enough it's uh it's it's but it does yeah it, it takes like you have to stick at it like yeah there's getting everyone to get the references to ring in just that part alone that pisses people off like it pisses mm -hmm. off people who work for you. like they're like i love this guy he's brilliant or i love this girl yeah. she's fantastic yeah i want to hire her and i'm like brilliant and then 
but I don't want to have to ask her to get a reference to Ring because yeah. they like them now and they feel like that sounds like they don't trust them or something. Yeah. And it's it yeah, yeah have, have it's we... hard, you know. It's yeah. not if it was easy, everyone would be doing it for years. Yeah. So I mean, like that's why no one really does it. And like yeah. we're really open. We do this. I recommend this to everyone and hardly anyone follows it because it's just pain in the ass, you know. Yeah. I mean? so. Yeah. One one of the things that for, from a process perspective is like in an ideal world, if, if we're able to tell someone from the age set that this is what's going to be involved. Now the reference one is a because that's you know it's it's usually very positive. Some someone's progressed to that level, um, but we we find that if there is say, say if there's four stage of an interview, if we're able to outline that from the age set, you know people are generally cool with that. If they if they've involved in other processes, then so be it. Um, mm. But but I I think once to sort of clarity. You know, at, at the beginning, I think that, you know, that, that certainly makes life, uh, you know, pe- people are on the same I, page. I don't think, we're, like the people we hired, I don't think we ended up losing out on anybody in the end. Yeah. That we yeah. really, I think we got the best candidate. Yeah. Before, uh, yeah. Definitely. And um, I think for the other candidates, I, I, was, I wasn't quite as involved, but yeah. like they've been fantastic who we've yeah. got. I, I don't think, you know what I mean? And we definitely unearthed. Like with the CFO, it's less, hiring a CFO is less about unearthing like a gem because it's like, yeah. you know, that's more somebody who's really good. Hmm. So they have to be really good already. It's a bit different. But I think for the other roles, we've unearthed a couple of really, yeah. real gems there that yeah. scored fantastic on the MMAT and yeah. did really good McQuaigs and yeah. they're doing brilliant in Forest right now. So, so it definitely works, you know? Yeah, yeah. And just in relation to the, you know, involving people. So, so one of the things or well, a couple of things that I, I, you know, I was sort of struck by. So um, I worked, worked with a lot of Irish entrepreneurs uh, in recruiting finance directors and CFOs. And while most would involve the team in terms of making a decision and sometimes the board, the decision is made by the founder, the CEO at the start and at the end, uh, you know, and, and very often they try a little bit of a consensus type decision, but Usually, I'm told during the process, once you get the green light from X, what struck me with you was how interested you were in your colleagues' opinions and also how structured the board discussion seemed to be as well. Was, was that always the case in terms of getting that sort of consensus piece uh, from a hiring? And I guess we're sort of moving into the culture side as well and, and, and um, you know, maybe sort of sharing the decision then in terms of when it comes to sort of an important new appointment. Yeah, like it's, it can, yeah, like our, our culture is, is, it's not everything isn't consensus based, but there's definitely a lot more consensus in our culture than other cultures, I would say. And my MO when it comes to making a decision uh, that's going to be controversial, like if it's a really obvious decision, it's obvious, but if, it's, if there's any sort of controversy about it, my, my decision, my MO is always to ask people what they think and to lay out the facts. And invariably, they'll probably come to the same decision I would. But then we've all made decision together. Do you hmm. know what I mean? So, um, and that's really important if it's a, a decision that's going to affect a lot of people, you know, that they feel that they've played a part in it. And, you know, there's definitely been times when I've done that and they've had a different view to me. So we've ended up, I've ended up not taking that decision. Yeah. Um, which has probably worked out well. Do you know what I mean? So, I, I, yeah, I, lo- I like people being involved in decision making because I think you've, the more people are involved in the decision, or the more people that are involved in making decisions in a business, the more um, the more connected they feel to the business, yeah. the more passionate they are at the business, the more they want Buy-in. to be, the more yeah. they want to stay with the business, all that kind of yeah. stuff. So look, it's a juggle all the time. Like you can't you can't run a, you can't run everything by consensus. So there's there's some sort of uh, thing and I, I I or there's some sort of balance and there's definitely people who come into forest and kind of go, Jesus, we take ages to make some decisions. And, uh, that's, uh, that's a downside to it. Do you know what I mean? So we mm. can sometimes be slow on things and sometimes be really fast. So it's, um, but overall, I think mostly we get the balance right. And, you know, you can see it like on Glassdoor or, or like talking to people in forest, like there's, there's very much a, a, a very positive view of the culture from yeah. people mostly like not everyone loves it it's not for everyone either you know what i mean some people yeah. don't like it and yeah. uh, some people aren't going to be the same values as we have so they yeah. might be really successful in another business and hate working in forest and that is totally fine hmm. you know so um but uh yeah so and how have you achieved so so how many what how many employees do you have many staff do you have now in total 
So we we're slightly less than when we have. So we're 175 mm. at the moment. Yeah, yeah. It's still, I mean, it, it that, that's a strong Irish company. Um, and just in terms of achieving, because you know, you seem to very much have a culture by design. Um, how how have you, as the business has grown, grown, and what what have you sort of adopted, or what what's sort of working for you at the moment in terms of keeping those you know values at the forefront, keeping the structure. Uh, you know, with the values structure in place, basically that, that people are sort of aware living this, and I guess there's a standard of performance that that that, that, mm. that they're ex- that you expect. So the values um, have been again. I got the values from good to great back in 2006, and so we sat down. We only had about 10 people in the company at the time, and we came up with three values, and they're pretty much the three values we have today um, at 175 people because they're um, and they've just been they just. I just, I just bought into that when I read that book and I, I, I was just banged on about those values all the time and then we've hired for them and then they've just got stronger as well because the more you hire for a certain value, like it just takes on a, a life of its own. It's just really hard to um, explain. Like you, 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 you do need to keep, like values are important to me so I will always talk about them. When we have a company all hands, we'll give out reward, awards, value awards and we've been doing that on and off for 15 years or 14 years so that kind of stuff means that you know you're going to go like johnny was amazing um because he did this which is one of our values and we've been doing that like for 14 years it it just becomes part of the culture um and then what we do is we usually get the teams to vote for the person in their team who represents the values the most so the team is choosing those people so the teams are thinking about it the teams are making the decision and then those people are getting rewarded for that, you know, and it just creates this kind of perpetuates this thing. Um, and uh, yeah, so yeah, you just, it's always values that we just talk about all the mm. time. Do you know, yeah. it's part of the, it's, it's hard to explain. Um, uh, it's just so part of everything we do that it's very hard to explain. Yeah. Um, yeah. What we kind of do deliberately now, because it's just mm. there. But like yeah. people, so have, we've had a people team now for a year and they've been doing a great job and they, we brought in somebody very experienced um, on a sort of advisory level and then we developed the people, guys from within our company. So the, the kind of, the, man, the manager, the people manager is, is somebody who's been with the company for seven years. Um, so she would have been very much part of the culture and understands all those values and everything like that, be part of helping, if, you know, create them as well or, perpetuate them over the years so it's very easy for them to really buy into that because they're you know they know what that is and yeah. um and and then it's become a bit more systematic as you get bigger you can you have more systems in your business it's a bit more structured so we have it structured in that they don't get hired unless they have the values yeah. they do a values um workshop in their first week with the company um you know in their induction which is about three weeks one of the things is a ceo induction with myself and half of that is about the values, you know, yeah. and then they see value awards, you know, every six months there's value awards for people. Um, every week there's a CEO update, uh, that I write to the whole team and I reference the values yeah. you know, every week in some way, or one of the values, do you know what I mean? So it just gets talked about and, and yeah. then if you're a manager, you're then hiring people. So then you're thinking about the values all the time. Yeah. You know I mean? How yeah. did that person score on values? You're going to get asked. Do you know what I mean? So you're going to need to know. So, um, just becomes part of the system yeah know? and we, we touched upon a board there i mean you assemble a board obviously you, you know it, it's something you, you appear to have a, you know a very strong group uh mm-hmm. at what, what point did forest sort of journey or development did, did that come about so we were we had we've been bootstrapped from like 2004 slash five we started you know it didn't start bang on one day kind of just emerged over a year or so and then um until 2011, uh, we raised money for the first time. We raised like a million euro seed money. Um, and we, we, we had like 30 people in the company, the 25 people I think it was at the time. So we had a business and we were, you know, mm. we had a million in revenue. But, um, and then we, we, we raised money and part of raising the money, we had to create a board. So it was myself, co-founder, Jamie, and basically two investors on the board. And one of them became the chairman. And we got really lucky, a guy called Pat Garvey who's an amazing chairman and he's still the chair today and he's a really successful business guy in his own right. Um, 
he'd been on public boards, but he'd also built his own business as an entrepreneur and sold it for like 400 million. So, you know, he'd, he'd been there and done that a million times. And uh, he's all about values and, you know, you know, doing things the right way and uh, not letting you away with anything, you know. So just um, that kind of created a, a really good discipline for the company. It kind of gave me, uh, I had to answer to someone for the first time. Yeah. And so there's things like the values and all that stuff that we're already doing. But I suppose on the more business objective side and mm. you know, budget side, and we're going to do this this year, I didn't really have anyone to answer to. So we, you know, we'd never really say, oh, we're going to make this much money next year. Like yeah. we never had a budget. Do you know, we never had a projection. Like we just did what we did. Do you know what I mean? And how, how, did, how did you adapt to that role as a, as a swashbuckler yeah, entrepreneur? Yeah. <laughs> I find it really hard. Um, I hated it for the first year. I, I, I knew it was good for me. So I went through it, but like mm. I, I hated it. and I didn't really have a choice because we'd be taking our money. But mm. yeah, I didn't like it. I don't like answering to anyone, to be honest. Um, but uh, it was really good for me and yeah. made the company much more disciplined and uh, it, yeah you, it, it, it's definitely a good thing yeah I, I'm not sure we, we needed it earlier than that do you know what I mean I'm not sure would we have grown faster if we'd had that earlier on I don't know actually don't know um, yeah. possibly not possibly needed to kind of do the journey we did where we yeah. learned things as they went Um so I don't know if you want to do that too early. I'm not sure. Yeah. But definitely from that point. Once you had about a million in revenue, I think you need a board. Yeah. I would say. Yeah. And within the international growth piece, we, we, you and I had a couple of interesting discussions in terms of, you know, embedding the right people and the right culture there. Um, what, what, what have been your sort of biggest learning ex experience or successes maybe on that front as you go into new markets? So... So, say, can you just say that question again? So, yeah, we, we were talking about forest expansion into new countries. Yeah. And we were just talking about sort of upholding, well, first of all, getting quality people on the ground in those countries yeah, and yeah, yeah, doing the sort of organic piece where you bring people over or, you know, finding the right local people. And then, I guess, se separate of that then, I guess, building out the value structure, you know, to achieve, I guess, some coherency, consistency with the yeah. Dublin-based HQ. Yeah, so I've, I've, I've kind of come, my view... Uh, originally was got to do it with your own people because uh, that's the culture was so important to Forrest mm. um, but actually it's a mixture of the two things it's it's like having people so when we had people in other territories initially um, who weren't our values it created a lot of friction um, internally and so we didn't really get the best out of those launch those international launches I would also say that um but then if you only have your person internally they don't have any of the relationships or the context or the, mm. the knowledge of that market how it works you know it takes them a few years to learn that so there's a balance in between um which i think we've nailed really well in like australia and germany for example where in germany we we got a husband and wife team who'd had their own sound software for 10 years and then had been distributing another one for a year and so they had all the context, they knew the market, they knew what it needed, um, and they, they were a fit with us. So, you know what I mean? Like culturally, they were a fit with us. So that's worked incredibly well. Uh, obviously, teething problems like anywhere, but like overall, we've come through this really strongly over the last few years, and it's just going gung ho now in Germany. I think we're going to be number one in Germany within the next two years, which is an amazing achievement. Fantastic. And those guys are driving that. It just works really well, the combo. And Australia as well, uh, we have, you know, the ex-CEO of our, our largest competitor worldwide um, is, is the CEO in, in Australia. So she's just like, this is a breeze to her, let's be honest. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. in the Australian team with 10 people, she's used to managing 200 people and yeah. 10 people. So she's just done it all. So she, she can do it a few days a week. Like it's just easy to her. I give her my job if you move over here, you know? So just... Um, yeah, so it's just she she knows what she's doing, and uh, and and we knew that she was a cultural fit. You know what I mean? So we we went through that cultural check, the McQuaigs, you know, all the stuff. The M A T. Like she went through the same process. Back channel references were easy because we knew loads of people who knew. Yeah. So that was you know they were all really strong, and um, so that's just worked really well. Uh, so I I think having um, the markets grow faster if you have somebody who's done it before in that market, or at least has worked in this industry in that market, do you know? Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, but has your values. Yeah. If they don't have your values, you're going to have problems, you know? Yeah. And if we talk about the industry then, I guess the salon industry now, and I know, look, we're obviously in a difficult situation at the moment where, you know, retail units globally are, are sort of closed down. I, I know there's some, um, potentially some white smoke, but maybe up until COVID-19, maybe just the trends in the sector, and then maybe how you see the next two or three years developing. And I, and I, I, sector, do you mean like SaaS, like software services? Yeah, well, sorry, yeah, with well, the SaaS sector as well. Sorry, maybe the SaaS sector on one side, and then just the salon. I, I know you have some interesting views just in relation to, how salons are run, basically, and just the trends, uh, you know, that, that are sort of taking place globally on that front would, would be interesting to understand. Yeah, so I, I would say that um, on the SaaS side, like SaaS is obviously, um, it's kind of, it's almost as obsolete, the term SaaS, because it's basically software now. You know what I mean? Mm. Like every software yeah, fair is SaaS, it's cloud based, yeah. And every industry is getting eaten by software. So it's just the economy, you know, in some ways, it's like the economy. So it's, it's hard to say. And because, but because there's still early doors in terms of how much software is paid on a SaaS basis, it's still r- reasonably low, like it's less than 50% or something still. So it's still got loads of growth um, in it as a sector. And we would see that in our sector. So like, you know, there's still 40% or more of, of salons still running on on-premise solutions. So so- software that's installed on their computers that they don't have even online bookings or, you know, if the computer dies, they lose all their information, this kind mm. of stuff, you know? So um, they can't access it from their phone. So just basic things that you can imagine a small business needs, um, and they're still doing that. So there's still a certain amount of growth for us comes from taking people off these systems. I mean, we're, you know, 50% of our sales every month probably come from someone moving from one of these older systems. Mm. So uh, still, that still be driving it a good bit. Anyway, that's like that's that's not just us. That's any SaaS company yeah. uh, or whatever. So, and that was going really well. That you know the valuations of SaaS companies increasing all the time as people you know could see that recurring revenue is such a good business model. You know you're getting higher uh, valuations, and the valuations are you know crazy big on the on the stock market and stuff like that for SaaS. So that like it was due a correction at some point because yeah. once it becomes just the mainstay, it doesn't make sense for the mainstay economy to be worth a hundred times revenues, like that just doesn't make any sense, you know, or 50 times revenues or 20 times revenue. So that was going to come back down at some point. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're due a correction at some point, mm. obviously because of that. Um, and this is obviously <laughs> going to trigger it probably. Yeah. Um, but long term, like SAS is still going to be more important in two years time than it is now. So, um, you know, if 40% of our sounds are running on premise software today, that number is going to be less in two years time. Yeah. So companies yeah. like us are going to be picking that up. Hopefully it's us, but you know, other companies as well. Yeah. Um, in terms of the industry, uh, the hair and beauty industry is, it's just one of those industries that is, it's just this evergreen industry that's existed since, I mean, there's evidence of some sort of hairdresser salon in like Babylon, Babylon, Babylonian times. Mm. I mean, you're talking like 4,000 years ago. So, it's one of the oldest industries that have ever existed and you can't, uh, people have always wanted to make themselves as soon as mm. they settled in groups, they wanted to make themselves look pretty or somebody wanted to do that. So, or look better. So that's existed for forever and will continue to exist forever in some form. It hasn't really changed that much. I mean, in Ro- ancient Rome, there would have been a salon uh, that people could have gone to, um, you know, and 2000 years later, there's a salon near you that you can go to like, and in that salon, somebody will cut your hair or mm. give a massage or, you know, give you a facial or obviously newer services that are kind of more, more recent, but it's, you know, the concept of it hasn't changed that much and it's unlikely to change that much because you're not really going to want a robot to do a lot of these services. Like a lot of yeah. it comes from the physical interaction and things like that. So it has been affected yeah. by COVID because it's a physical interaction. So obviously salons are shut everywhere. Yeah. You can kind of see it's one of the things that trend on social about like people cutting their hair. I and mean, we talked about it at the beginning of this yeah. episode. So everyone yeah. talks about it when you get your hair cut. Yeah. You know, when you get your hair colored because the roots are showing or whatever. Yeah. COVID roots as they're calling it and all this. Yeah. Stuff. So you're you're like it's people want to get back to the salon. So I think like long term you can say salons will still exist and they'll survive. Mm. It's just it's just gonna be difficult because they're gonna have um if they can only have 
if the salon could have 10 people in it before and now can only have five because of social distancing and that goes on for two years yeah a vaccine comes their, their revenues are going to be 50 percent down so yeah they're going to be yeah. affected and if people are loads of people are unemployed like they are and there's going to be a lot more you know there's yeah. going to be a lot more people unemployed in six months than there was last year right yeah and yeah. um even after government sports go away so what does that mean to people they're not going to be spending as much money in salons so salons yeah. will get affected just like they did in 2008 yeah there'll be a downturn um but they'll still exist and i guess yeah. that kind of the the um you know the good thing about the industry is it will continue yeah. to exist i think mm. and i guess just just finally just in relation to the the sort of working habits that will continue um you know it's obviously there's a big big focus on remote working now and the discussion around it. I mean, my, my two cents is I, th I think some companies were set up for it. Um, it suits some people. Um, well, a lot, lot of, um, you know, family powers aren't necessarily set up. And you've also got some people maybe who have a different, you know, in their mind, they're either in work or they're at home. And, and therefore, yeah. it's from a sort of a, a mindset perspective, there's been an adjustment. Uh, but in, in, you know, and look, this might be very ambitious, but in six months from now, if everything, the world is back to normal, whether it's through a vaccine or, you know, really advanced testing, how, how different do you think we should expect it to be? I mean, you, you guys, I think we were saying before, you were reasonably well set up for remote working. What, what, what's your expectation, Ron, in relation to business in Ireland on that front? So it was happening. This trend was happening anyway. It was another angle for us to get good talent. So like in like half our dev team are remote. Yeah. Um, this isn't like outsourced. This is, you know, people who work for us and we employ them, but they live, you know, in Argentina or they live in Poland or wherever, but they're on Irish salaries, you know, like, so it, it gave us the opportunity to get talent that we possibly, we'd be more, you know, be harder to get because we're Soft, really software developers. So, and, so we were yeah. moving that way. Yeah. And a lot of our team, they can look at the marketing team. They were doing one or two days from home already. Like everyone was kind of, every mm. team was starting to do at least a day from home. Most of the teams anyway. Uh, so customer support and stuff like that was more tricky um, because of the tools and things like that. It worked mm. better uh, in the office, but that's also moved online now. Um, so just to really accelerate it. Uh, uh, so most people were able to do it. I, I actually didn't like it. I never worked from home. I always worked in the office. I like walking. I walk to work. It's half an hour walk. It kind of clears my head in the morning and the evening. So I like doing that. And I find that harder to adjust. So I'm sitting here in a, like a, a rocking chair mm. in the <laughs> yeah, yeah. bedroom doing, working away. But yeah. I'm used to it now. I'm finding I'm, I am very productive. Yeah. Probably more productive doing this. Yeah. So I definitely we chat to the, my wife works uh, full time as well. And she's, she used to do one day from home and uh, we're just, you know, we're going to set up the, the house, I think a bit better for it. Yeah. Once we're able to do things. So, um, yeah, so I think, I think I'm going to be going doing two, two, three days from home. I think yeah. everyone in the company is probably going to be doing two, three days from home. I don't think we're going to need as big an office. We yeah. had an office, 30 people in America. Uh, we basically canceled the lease on that. Um, it was full, but we cancelled the lease on it because we've been working fine remotely and we'll go back to having some sort of meeting space, you know, where people can come in and do a hot desk and for every now and then and, and make it much more flexible. Um, you know, we were kind of tied into one city, which is Philadelphia, and we don't necessarily need to be as tied to Philadelphia. You know, we can maybe attract talent from across the states. Um, if we're more remote, why wouldn't we do that? So it makes more yeah. sense. Our office in Dublin, which is, you know, we have a lovely office in Dublin, um, but we were a fill, it was completely full. And now we're starting to think like, um, you know, that we are trying to expand it in next door and stuff like that and probably continue to do that. But like, we probably, that office could possibly last another 10 years now, whereas we were like a year or two away from it. Cause we'll probably, it's just set it up for hot desking and, yeah. you know, we don't need to worry about that kind of stuff. So I, I think I, I would be short on uh, commercial real estate, hmm. uh, going forward. I, 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 I think that's overvalued, I would say. Yeah. Just people are going to be like, why bother spend all this money on commercial, you know, an office space? Yeah. When yeah. you could spend less, still have an office, but just have less of it. Yeah. And then free up that buildings for residential. Yeah. Like that. And, and think, you, yeah. you, you think it's, it's still feasible to achieve the culture, high performance culture to the level that you're, you know, you would want with people working. And, and the reason I ask is I was at a conference once. Uh, I, I think there was a senior guy on Intel, you know, which yeah. Intel is obviously a very successful company. And his view was um, 
that you know a lot of a lot of very successful businesses are are raised through people working very hard day and night together in a room, brilliant people, brilliant ideas, and mm. maybe you lose a little bit of that with remote working, but you know may, maybe there's a sort of a, a way of around those pieces. I'm just just interested your view on that. Yeah, I don't know. Like I, I don't know if that's true. Like uh, a lot of my best insights have come from phone calls. You know, when mm. you're just chatting away to somebody. Yeah. Um, have an idea. I ring one of the guys. We we riff on it. He has an idea. Rings me. We riff on it. Like we've been doing that. Loads of our best ideas have come out of the last six weeks. Yeah, I just don't think it's true. I think there's benefits to the culture of being together, and then there's yeah. benefits of being separate. Like you, you're more productive when you're not in an office. Yeah. Um, and then maybe the culture is a, a little bit easier to build when you're together physically. But you know, what would you want? Mm. would you take a slight dip in culture for a big increase in productivity which would then feed into your culture because then your culture is just more productive and then that is your culture do you know what i mean yeah, yeah. so i think i i don't know i know companies that are fully remote um there's like this uh what are they called um there's a massive company of like a thousand people um they power the internet wordpress like they have a thousand employees yeah. Or every single one is remote. Yeah. Hugely successful company. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing Honestly. culture. Everyone who works there seems to think it's a great culture. So what, yeah. what are you saying? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Just don't, I think it's very hard for somebody who, if you come from Intel and you're older generation and hmm. you've, you've, uh, see, your, your, your success in your head is what you've lived through and they've probably been really successful. But have they lived through a successful like remote business? They've yeah, never done it. So how would, how would they have any idea? All they yeah. know is that somebody goes home from that existing culture and doesn't seem to be working as hard. Hmm. But like that's not the same. That's not a remote culture. Like that's yeah. just somebody's gone home. Do you know what I mean? Like so, uh, and is away from where the hub is. But yeah. the culture can exist. Like with Zoom and everything like that, you know, you have to do different things. But um uh, yeah, my view would be our culture is is never been as strong as it's been the last month yeah. for having to go through this and everyone's at home. But it look, there's things that I know like it's tough. It's really tough if you have no child, you've ch- children, young children, and you've no child minding access yeah. to child minding because everyone's stuck at home. Yeah, that's really tough. We're really lucky. I, we had a child minder who came in every day, and we she lived up the road. And we asked her to move in, and she said yes. Thank thank the Lord, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. He said, yes. And that's changed it. So that means that me and my wife can work during the day. But yeah. we know people who, um, they just don't have that option. And it's not, it's not yeah. a money thing. Like it's like literally they can't get somebody no matter what they would pay. So yeah. basically they're, they have to juggle the duties, the kid yeah. duties during the day. And that means you're less productive. So, but that gets cured, I think by, um, you know, once we get out of COVID that, issue goes away that's just a covid issue that's yeah. not a working from home issue do you know what i mean yeah yeah so um, and, and there's probably it'll probably relieve a little bit because dublin is a busy city for traffic i mean from a job seeker's perspective just the amount of people who make decisions based on location you know i i it sometimes frustrates me a little because i think it's very short-sighted that if there's a really good role and it's an extra but it, you know everyone just there is a lot of bottlenecks around the city and i think i think this will be a genuine game changer um so ron you've been brilliant with your time and i'm, I'm just i promised you uh we you know with max and our i i, I know you've plenty uh going on i, I think i promised your uh, your assistant it would be an Max. anything we've missed just on the people side uh, i mean it'd be brilliant re- really really interesting information this would be of huge interest i think to well to other entrepreneurs growing businesses but uh, you know particularly the hr community a lot, lot of hiring managers and anything else that you feel that we, we've, we've missed there that you maybe wants to wrap up on um no i think i think i've uh, okay I've, I've bored your listeners enough i'm sure yeah it's, yeah, yeah. Well, brilliant. Listen, I'll, 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 I'll cut the recording, but th- thanks a million for your time, Ronan. You yeah. can stay put there just for a moment. I'm just going to, uh, to put a pause on this.